you guys are really, truly, and honestly hoping that something happens inside of you and that you're willing to present yourself to the Holy Spirit and hope and believe that God's going to speak to you, that it's going to make a difference, that it's going to change your life, and that you're going to have fruit coming into your life because of what you learned tonight. Well, after that introduction, I almost hate to do this, but I'm going to start with a little humor. Um, And these are actually true uh, bulletins that were printed. These are things that secretaries printed. They actually went into the bulletin that you hold in your hand. By the way, keep that. That's your receipt that you were actually at church. So you want to keep that. Um, but these are some things that were actually printed in a bulletin or announced from the pulpit, or in a couple of cases, uh, these were put on the signs that are out in front of church. You remember those, some of those signs you see out in front of church? So uh, some of these are just some mistakes. Uh, typos, or uh, just unfortunate uh, selection of words. Here's the first one that was printed on a sign outside of a church. The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on water. The sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. (laughs) Here's one in the bulletin. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Be sure to bring your husbands. <laughs> Here's one that was on a church bulletin board. Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. <laughs> I don't know about this one. you got to think. A bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. <laughs> uh, let's see. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They may be seen in the basement on Friday afternoon. (laughs) Here's a, looks like a typo. This evening at 7 p.m., there will be a hymn singing in the park across from the church. Bring a blanket and come prepared to sin. (laughs) Here, (laughs) I think this is my favorite. Low self-esteem support group will meet Tuesday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. (laughs) Well, communication is difficult. It's hard to uh, get it out the way you want to say it, isn't it? We're going to talk a little bit about speech and the tongue. James chapter 3, verse 5 says this. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, but it boasts of great things. Now, the tongue is really a very small part of the body. There are many organs and parts to your body that are bigger, that are uh, more impressive. And yet, is there any part of your body that's more powerful? The importance and power of the tongue goes far beyond its size. It's one of the things, speech is one of the things that separates us from the animal world. It's the ability to use language. It's part of what defines us as being made in the image of God. Now, think about this. God created the world by speaking. He said, let there be light. There was light, and he went down, and everything was created as God spoke it. And after God had finished creating the heavens and the earth and all life, all animal life, by speaking words... Then he created a being who also had the capacity to speak. And that, my friends, is a very powerful thing. Proverbs 18.21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Wow. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Right in here. Look at someone and go, watch where you point that thing. It's loaded. I mean, a tongue can hurt. A tongue can kill, according to this. Words can kill. In fact, words can damage a life the whole life long. We've all heard that saying, sticks and stones will hurt my bones, but words can never hurt me. Do you know the truth is that your body will recover from being hit by stones or by by being hit by sticks a lot quicker than it'll 
recover from destructive words spoken over your life, especially if it happened when you were young. Oftentimes, people look at the wreck that their life is. They look at broken relationships, broken families, lost opportunities, lost jobs, and they wonder, what's wrong? Why isn't there more blessing in my life? Why, why hasn't God helped me? And a lot of times, the answer is not that far away. It's right under their nose, right here. That their life has been determined by the words that they've spoken. James 3, 3 through 5 says this. Now we put the bits into the horse's mouth so they will obey us. So a small bit in the mouth of a horse will control it. And you can direct their entire body as well. Then look at ships also. Though they are great and they're driven by strong winds, yet they're directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Just like a small bridle can direct a horse and a small rudder can direct a ship, yet our lives are determined so often by what we say, when we say it, to whom we say it. Let's finish that verse in verse 5. Again, the tongue is a small part of the body. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Now, it says that just like a small fire can burn down a forest, our words have the capacity to do incredible damage. Do you know that last month was a 10-year anniversary of the Cedar Fire? If you remember, the Cedar Fire burned 280,000 acres. It left 2,200 families homeless, and it killed 15 people. And it all began because of one small signal fire, which was uh, begun by a lost hunter. And the Bible says <clears throat> that the tongue is equally powerful and can create as much damage. Now, the issue of the tongue is too important to be ignored. Now, this is a rhetorical question, but how many of you would like to have a good life? You'd like to be happy. You'd like to be successful. Well, if you would like that, you cannot ignore or be careless with your tongue. Look at what we read in 1 Peter 3, verse 10. The one who desires life, a good life, to love and to see good days, days, must, if you want those things, you must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Since the tongue is so powerful and since it is so determinative, you cannot have a good life. You cannot have blessings unless you learn how to master the tongue. You can't be careless or cruel or unfair with it or unthinking with it and then expect to have happiness. You see, the tongue determines the menu for our life. It determines what's for dinner tomorrow, so to speak. It determines what's going to be on your plate tomorrow. Proverbs 8.21 we're going to finish that verse we read. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it or those who indulge it will eat its fruit. You see, your provision or your allotment or the diet that you're going to have in your life is going to be largely a result of words that you speak. Will the diet of your life be plenty or will it be little? Will it be sweet or will it be bitter? A lot of that has to do with the words that you speak. Now, I've heard a lot of people say things like, well, I'm just outspoken. I just speak what's on my mind. And you know what? That's just the way I am. And people are just going to have to deal with it. How many of you guys have heard somebody have that basic attitude? Well, we all have. And maybe you've even said that. 
But when they say, I just speak what's on my mind, and people just have to deal that I'm outspoken, here's what they're really saying. They're saying, I speak before I know all the facts. I speak before I've heard both sides. I speak without thinking what impact my words might have on other people or on my future. Words can destroy relationships. Words cost people jobs. Words close doors in the future that God would open for you. Ephesians 4, verse 29, we read this. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only these words, only such a word that is good for edification. That means it builds people up according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And so the first thing that we learn is that our words can transmit grace, that God's life can be spoken out of our mouth to build up people and situations around us. Words matter. Words are powerful. That's why I'm responsible for the words that I set into motion. Next verse. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the second thing we learn is that my words can grieve the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit wants to do wonderful things in my life, in my family, in my circle of friends, in your business, in this church, but my words can quench and grieve what God wants to do. Verse 31. Therefore, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And this says, finally, this. If I'm going to use my mouth to speak words of life and blessing upon others that will bring blessing into my life, before I can do that, I have to deal with with the issues of my life. I have to deal with my stuff. Because if there is bitterness, and if there is anger, and there is resentment in my heart, and I do not deal with it, then I cannot speak those words of blessing. We're going to see it a little bit later that Jesus said that out of the mouth speaks the heart. He said that it's out of that which fills the heart that the mouth speaks. My words express what is in my heart. And so if I want to speak words of life, words of blessing that bless me and bless others, I've got to be willing to deal with the heart. And a lot of people don't want to deal with the heart. They don't want to go there. They don't want to face it. And so they get caught in this trap of continually speaking words of anger or words of doubt or frustration. And they hate, they realize that their mouth gets them in trouble but what they don't realize is that it's flowing inevitably out of a heart that they're not willing to fully bring to Jesus. Hebrews 12, 15 tells us this. It says, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not want to fall short of God's grace. God's grace is God's help. It's God's power. I like to call grace God's enabling. So there's so much that God wants to do through me and in me, but I can fall short of that. And in this case, how do you fall short? Lest any root of bitterness spring up and causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now, when you allow bitterness or anger into your heart, when you, when you take up offense and you don't deal with it, you don't forgive, when you can't give something to God and so it festers in you, it begins to root into your heart. And as it roots down into your heart, it says it springs up. You see, as the roots go down, the tree begins to grow in your life and pretty soon it bears fruit. And for the most part, that fruit is going to be words that you speak. And Fruit has seeds in it. So as the words come out, which is the fruit of this bitterness, it has seeds. And as the people around us, whether it's 
our children or our neighbors or our coworkers, people we have influences, as they begin to take our words inside of themselves, they become what? Defiled. Because the bitterness begins to take root. There's seeds in those words. And pretty soon, all around us, we see unhappy families. We see unhappy workplaces. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, he said that we would have to give an account for every idle or thoughtless word. See, it's the thoughtless words that reveal what's in our heart. It's just you bump us and what comes out. That for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. You see, that's because our words are powerful. They reveal our heart. And our words can destroy and they can build up. They can destroy or build up a marriage. They can destroy and build up the children God gives us. They can destroy or build up a church or a neighborhood. Now, no family and no church is perfect. No workplace is perfect. No person is perfect. And in every situation, there are two background voices. There are two spiritual voices that are always speaking. The first is the voice of the intercessor, and that's the voice of Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, always making intercession for us. And so Jesus is always at the right hand of the Father, and he's speaking forgiveness towards us. He's praying that strength and grace would be outpoured upon each of our lives. The other voice is the voice of the accuser. Do you know that the devil, the word devil in the Greek literally means the accuser? The Bible says that whereas Jesus is interceding at the right hand of God, the Bible says that Satan in Romans, excuse me, Revelation 12 that Satan accuses the saints before the throne of God every day. And so we have a choice. Which of those two voices are we going to become a spokesman for? Are we going to speak death? Are we going to speak the curse of Satan, the accusation of Satan? Or are we going to speak the words of blessing and of life over those around us? We can use our tongue to sow discord, and, or we can, sow, we can sow the words of our mouth to bring peace. It's a wonderful thing to be a peacemaker. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. You know, one of the things I think that keeps some people from having a close relationship with God when they feel like God is far away is that they're not peacemakers. They haven't purified their hearts, surrendered their hearts so they can speak words of peace. Because it says that if we're peacemakers, we'll see God. John Maxwell uh, said something years ago. Uh, well, I was, I don't know, 20 years ago, I was hearing him talk. And he said that all of us walk around with two buckets. One is filled with water and one is filled with gasoline. And as we are walking through the course of our life in the different places, whenever we come upon a small fire that's caused because of a misunderstanding or it's caused because of some kind of conflict, we have a choice to make. We can either throw the bucket of water on that fire and be a peacemaker, or we can join in and we can throw gasoline on it and we can leave it bigger than when we came. So the question is, how many of you guys have heard gossip or heard criticism about somebody just this week? So how do we deal with it when we hear critical words or accusations? I'm going to give you three steps. Number one, first thing you should do each time is ask, should this involve me? Some people are talking critically about somebody or about a situation, or maybe it's at work. The first question, you, this is the one I always ask myself, should this involve me? Is it within my circle or responsibility of influence? If I hear a bad report, but that person is not under, is not under my responsibility, or the situation is not under my 
responsibility. Why should I get involved? Why should I receive it? Number two, ask the person who's given you the bad report. How do you know this to be true? Because a lot of times it's just a second-hand or a third-hand report. It's just gossip. Ask them, have you contacted the person themselves and heard their side of the story? You see, Matthew 28 is very clear. First of all, the Bible tells us never receive any report except on the basis of two or three witnesses. I hear, Dave and I hear reports all the time about this pastor did this or this pastor did that, and I never feel any responsibility. I will not hear it if it's unsubstantiated. Do you know how much easier that makes it? Because I have a responsibility as a leader in the body of Christ here in San Diego and East County to um, confront situations that might be out of step with a fellow pastor or something. However, if it's an unsubstantiated report, the Bible's clear I'm not to receive it. You know how much easier that makes it? If you hear a bad report, here's what you do. First of all, the Bible says, Matthew 28, it's a good study, that if someone has something against somebody else or hears about a sin, what are they to do? They are to go and talk to that person directly. They are not to talk to anybody else until they've talked to that person. If the person doesn't listen, what are they to do? Then they're to go to one or two other trusted people, and uh, they are to ask them to go and to talk to that person. Only then do they make the second report, or do they report to anybody else. Finally, if the person in question really is in sin and won't listen, then finally, number, st- number three, you pass it on upwardly. You never go beyond that two or three, and you never talk to anybody else that's a peer. The next thing that you do is you talk to someone that's in charge, whether it's the pastor of the church, whether it's the boss at work. And once you've done that, it's no longer your responsibility. You understand? God's not going to, if, if you hear about something that's going wrong, it's a coworker, it's someone at church, and you get the report and you go to them and, and it's not satisfying, and you talk to the boss or you talk to the pastor or whatever, whoever's in, in charge, it's not your problem. God's going to hold the person sitting and the person in authority responsible and nobody else. If you follow this simple plan that Jesus gives us in Matthew 28, listen to me. You're going to protect yourself. You're going to protect the person who's passing on the bad report. You're going to keep them from going any farther into that sin, and you're going to protect the person that they're talking about. You see, the slanderer, the person that passes on gossip or false reports, always hurts three people. First, he destroys his own soul because he's taking poison inside and because he is disqualifying himself from receiving all the blessings of God. The second person that he hurts is the person that's being spoken against. Proverbs 11, 9, that's the scripture there, didn't make it. It says, with his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. That's Proverbs 11, 9. And so, By following God's purpose, you protect that person. And finally, the third person that's injured is the poor person, the unfortunate person who listens to the gossip, the next person to hear the gossip. Because, you see, once they ingest that poison into themselves, see, first just the gossiper has it. But once he goes on and tells another person and they ingest that, Now, they have the poison, the sin inside of them. Look at Proverbs 26, 22. The words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels, and they go down into the innermost parts of the body. Isn't that the way it works? Somebody comes and tells you something about somebody else, and it's kind of titillating. It's like a dainty morsel. It kind of... uh, Feels good to go down. I mean, we like to sit in judgment of other people. We like to feel like we're the insider. And if the slander is about a leader 
all the better because it sort of elevates us because now we're sitting in judgment of someone that's in leadership, whether it's at work or wherever else. And so it goes in like a dainty morsel. But uh, what did it go to say? That, let me find that. Uh, they go down into the innermost parts of the body. And so it is ingested and it goes into them. Now, gossip and slander and criticism, it's just a reality of life. How many people in this room have suffered because someone else gossiped about them or slandered them or passed on a false report? So all of us know what that's like. And uh, how many of you know that they gossiped about Jesus? Jesus never did anything wrong. And yet they accused him, they slandered him, they misspoke about him, and Jesus told us to expect the same. So let me just tell you a couple of little, a little bit of advice uh, as someone who has endured a lot of slander and misrepresentations. Let me just tell you a couple of things about how to deal with it. First of all, try to live in such a way that when people slander you, other people won't believe it. They'll say, you know what, that doesn't sound like the Joe I know. That's completely out of character for Joe. I love what Will, uh, Will Rogers said. He said, try to live in such a way that you wouldn't be afraid to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. <laughs> so that's the first. Try to live in such a way people won't believe the slander. Here's the second. When you're being slandered and gossiped, I know it can hurt, but try not to focus on the slander or the gossip. Instead, try to focus on the Lord's provision for you in that situation. Now listen to this great scripture, Psalm 31, verse 20. It says about God that you hide them. Put your name in there. Okay? You hide Mark in the secret place. Isn't it wonderful that God has a secret place set for you? You hide them in the secret place of your presence, far from the conspiracies of men. Men can, and women can make their conspiracies, but God has a place for you to rest. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. So God has a place of grace and fellowship for you, even though other people might be uh, mocking your name. Listen, if, if uh, God wasn't worried about Jesus' reputation, how many of you know we shouldn't be worried about ours? God's probably not that worried that people don't speak well of us. Who, <laughs> I love what Charles Simpson said. Um, I don't know if he said it in church or to me privately. But he said one time he was complaining about people because he said, he said, I'm not as bad as they say you are. They say I am. And uh, he felt in his heart like God said, well, a lot of people think you're better than you are. I never hear you complain about them. <laughs> so <clears throat> don't let anything that anyone says or anything that anyone does provoke you to leave that secret place God has for you. Don't let anything make you run out of there and try and defend yourself or be upset because God has peace. He has support. He has love. He has a hiding place for you. Don't ever let the destructive words of... Is everyone listening to this? This is very important I'm going to say. Don't ever let the destructive words of people drown out the word of God. Don't ever let the words of a parent or a spouse or your peers or your classmates growing up, don't ever let their destructive words drown out God's blessing and words of blessing to you. Because if you do, it makes you an idolater. Did you ever think about that? See, we think it makes us a victim. No, because what you're doing is you are elevating the word of your father, your mother when you were growing up, or what all your classmates said or anybody else. You're elevating that word above the word of God. 
you're placing the word of a human being above the word of God. And the only way to get out from under that and change your life is to repent. And I know a lot of times when we feel like when people have wronged, wronged us and we feel like we've been victimized, it's, it's like um, it doesn't make sense that we have to repent. But the problem isn't their words. The problem is the idolatry in our heart that is more afraid or more uh, hurt by their words than we are blessed and released by the words of our Heavenly Father. Our words matter when we speak because they're powerful, because they can kill, they can destroy. And God is listening to what we say. Now, the Israelites in the desert, after they came out of Egypt and Moses was leading them in the wilderness, you know the story. What did they do? They complained and they were afraid. And they kept saying, why did you bring us into the wilderness to die? Why did, we were in Egypt and we were safe, but you brought us out here. We're going to die. And no matter how many times God intervened, and did miracles. You remember he caused water to come out of a rock. He took bitter water and he made it sweet. There was manna that came down from heaven. And yet despite all that, out of their words, they kept cursing themselves. They kept speaking unbelief. Listen finally what God said through Moses. Numbers 14, verse 28. He says finally, say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken it in my hearing, so I will surely do unto you. You see, they wrote their own prescription. Do you know, sometimes we write a different future for ourselves than the one God has for us. We get out and we write a prescription that's not the one he has for us, but finally we speak it so much, it begins to come true. So if this is true, if our tongue is that powerful, if our words matter that much, not only to our own future, but if they can be so destructive to the people around us, how can we change so that we speak words of blessing? Now, that's an important question, isn't it? I hope it's one you're asking yourself. Because all of us can learn to speak less negative and to speak more life. We're going to go back to what Jesus said, Matthew 12, verse 34. He says, for the mouth speaks of that which fills the heart. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So if we want to change what we say, how do we start? We start with the heart. So if we will meditate on the promises of God, if we will go out and hear good teaching, if we will listen to good worship music, if we will spend time in the word of God, if we will learn to count our blessings every day and speak them out and thank God, do you know what? The condition of our heart will change and the words that come out of our heart will change. Now, as we've seen, the tongue can be destructive, but the tongue can also speak life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue we read. Do you know there is life in your tongue? There is life in your mouth, in your words. There is the power of eternity in your words. It is only through your words and the witness that people are transported from darkness into life. Isn't that true? As we share the gospel with people, as we share truth, as we bear witness of our own experience, God uh, transports life himself through our words. Now, tomorrow afternoon, or not afternoon, second service, we have uh, 28 people right now scheduled to be baptized. And every one of those persons people are being baptized from death into life because of the words spoken to them. Could have been by a parent. Could have been by a coworker, Could have been by someone that works in the 
bus route, but those words brought life. Beyond just evangelizing, you also have the power to bless. There is the power of blessing in your mouth. Proverbs 10, 11, what a beautiful verse. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. As you speak truth, you turn people from the pathway of death and destruction. As you bear witness to the truth, and you turn them towards life. As you speak words of blessing to people, you encourage them. Listen, you literally, as you speak words of truth and blessing, life goes into them. You breathe the life of God into them. What a powerful thing. Don't, ev uh, excuse me, don't ever underestimate the power of your words to do good in someone's life. They're not just your words. If you speak God's truth, God bears witness. God encourages through your words. You see, every single life that comes in to this world comes in full of promise. It comes in under a tremendous divine blessing. Genesis 1, 27 is very important. Genesis, of course, 1 and 2 are, two, are maybe two of the most powerful and important chapters in the Bible. It tells us the nature of everything. It explains everything. It tells us who we are. And listen to what this says. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, both male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said, and this is the blessing, be fruitful and multiply. This is the blessing. And fill the earth and subdue it and rule over everything. When God blessed the human race with those words, be fruitful, enlarge, expand, subdue. When he spoke those words, he spoke them to every person that would ever be born from Adam and Eve. You see, there is a powerful blessing spoken over your life. And when God blesses, how many you know he empowers? He doesn't speak empty words. When he says, be fruitful and multiply, he gives us the power to be fruitful, to multiply, to enlarge, to grow, to subdue, to overcome the world, to triumph. God says, I made you for a purpose, and I am with you. Now, Satan is the voice over every life that says no. He says no to you. And from your birth, from the birth of every person, Satan seeks allies to speak those words of death and cursing over people. He's looking for someone to give voice to his voice, to say no to you, no to the promises, no to the hopes, no to what God wants you to do. There may be, as I said, parents or classmates or peers or others in your life. But Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it in its abundance. He says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's Satan. But I've come that you might have life. And what God calls you and you and you and you and me and every one of us in this room is to look at the people around us, to realize everyone is born with promise. Everyone is born with a blessing over their life. And to recognize the promise of that life. To recognize the gifting that God has put in each person. And to call it into life by the words that we speak. By the blessing that we speak over each of those per people. So your tongue is powerful. It can evangelize. It can tell people the gospel. It can bring people from death into life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from being under bondage and destruction to being under life and growth. And you can also speak words of blessing as well that strengthens and encourages people and breathes God's life into them. 
Our words have great power. So here's my question. Why should we diminish the power that's in our tongue? By swearing? By telling silly, dirty jokes? Why, when we have this power, this power that God spoke the world into existence, that sets us apart from all the animals, why should we waste it? Why not make a study of how to speak life? Life that goes out to others and comes back to ourselves. God is at work all around us, and we can either use our mouths to uh, help him in what he's doing or to oppose it. Because God is working everywhere in every life. I want you to say this. Death and life. Go ahead. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And then it goes on to say, and those who love it, and that could be positive or negative, but let's take the positive, those who respect the power of the tongue, those who work to have the tongue bless, they can eat its fruit. They can have a lifetime where they've written a wonderful prescription for their life, where they've ordered a wonderful diet, where as they look into the future, they're going to have a good meal every day. I'd like to just have you stand for a minute as the band comes up here. And I want to just pray. I want to take a minute, and I want you just to think about what you've heard. And I want you to prepare to engage. Okay, I'm done talking. So you're done just listening. Now is the time for you to engage with God, the Holy Spirit, who's here. So go ahead and close your eyes, and let's think about this whole issue of our tongue, our words. I want you to pray like this in your heart. Pray this if you will. Lord, I dedicate my tongue to you. Lord, I thank you for this tremendous gift that you've given me. And Lord, I want to confess to you the sin of idolatry to the extent that I have allowed my heart, my understanding of myself, my view of life to have been formed by the words spoken by others, by those who gave voice to Satan's no. Lord, I want to repent that I have sometimes let those words drown out your word of blessing, your word of promise in the scripture. Forgive me. Lord, I want to honor you as the Lord of my life, the Lord of my thoughts. No one names me but you, Lord. I want to thank you that you have a purpose for my life, that you stand with me. Lord, I want to pray that you teach me to have the tongue of a disciple. Lord, to give strength to the weary one, to speak truth to the confused one, to give hope, Lord, to those in despair. And I want to thank you most of all, Lord, that I have a tongue with which to praise you. Let's do that. Let's use our tongue right now to sing praises to God. Let's right now, Lord, fill our hearts through the Holy Spirit with thankfulness, with praise, with gratitude. And may you help us to use our tongue right now to praise our Creator and our Savior.